Yeah, despite how cool some of these can be, you gotta admit, these are kind of pretty major cop-outs. Hey folks, Marcio X here. Now let's be real, no example of media out there is free from this trope. No show, game or movie can escape the clutches of this rather potent thing. This idea is something that just exists and it's just the way of the world. The supposed art of the cop-out, the apple, the MacGuffin. Today, we're going to be talking about the biggest examples in Dragon Ball's rather long history. How do you get yourselves out of a tricky situation with little hope or realistic chance of getting out of something logically? Jojo is both good at talking its way out of a problem and yet creating some of the biggest conveniences in the history of media, period. You go into a fight thinking, well, how did they get out of that one? But when they go to explain it, you go, oh, of course. Dragon Ball, for the most part, doesn't do that second bit. Most of the time, it gives you little explanation. If any, Toriyama, as he likes to write by the seat of his pants, doesn't really put as much thought into that chestnut as he probably should do. What inspired us for this discussion, though, was the goings-on from the latest chapter of the Dragon Ball Super manga. In chapter 73, it seems like Granola has gained access to the cheat console of Dragon Ball, somehow, because he's pulling moves out of his astounding collection of stolen techniques. Whatever has gone on in the past, he somehow seems to have that power now, despite not meeting them. Moro's Earth Key Blast, for example? Yep, he's got them, and this is all despite him not being a magical round man. He's just a man. So whether you're a fan of our mint head Cerulean over here, or you think he has quickly become the Shadow the Hedgehog of the Dragon Ball universe, one thing is for certain when it comes to this latest chapter. People have rather mixed feelings toward him, gaining so many powerful techniques just like this right now, in addition to the immense power in such an easy way. Even Hav and I are starting to get a little dubious about this. Where does this stop? Of course, it is connected to the price of the wish from Torombo that he has had to pay, which has shortened his lifespan by about 147 years or so, but come on. Not only is the guy now ridiculously strong, but he can also now steal other people's tricks? That's Goku's thing! And cells, and booze, and Piccolo's that one time when he tried to... Never mind. The point of all of this is people feel that this is a little bit world-breaking. It's quite jarring too, given that the last few chapters have been very good at building more of the world of Dragon Ball, even more than the previous arc had done. And that arc had done a lot already. Now it's starting to be torn apart again. And unless we get some rather logical explanations about how Granola acquired set techniques, other than simply getting them included in his ordeal with Torombo, time traveling techniques with no context behind them, I mean, that's our best guess. We can really understand why the community feels a little bit uneasy about this latest revelation. Now, we do like this arc, but even we're getting a little bit shaky. It's only a small tremor though, for now. Naturally, doing what we do, we have our own theories that can be found in our chapter 73 review or on the podcast regarding said chapter, but let's not try and deviate too much from the topic at hand. That is that the case of Granola gaining all these powers isn't exactly anything new in the case of Dragon Ball, suddenly turning stuff on its head and adding stuff that totally changes the rules of the world just like that. Some of these examples we've mentioned on certain occasions in previous videos, whilst others, sometimes, you don't even realise how out of the ordinary they were and how cheap they can feel when you have nostalgia goggles and have the cool factors going behind you. These easily could blindside you when you look at it from a more pragmatic point of view. So let's start with the one that we tend to mention the most frequently. Everything related to the Mecha Freezer mini saga. So you know what was cool? Something that was easily placed into the annals of anime history and marked a turning point in the world of Dragon Ball? Goku's climactic victory over Frieza. The bad guy tried to, in the face of his very imminent demise, use his goodwill against the Saiyan, but got burnt in the end. Something that looked and felt truly cathartic. That felt like a fitting end for the main antagonist of the first portion of the story. You could, in fact, end Dragon Ball Z right then and there, with the birth of Super Saiyan and the transformation of Goku into something utterly unrecognisable from his former self. It's a natural end point, but no, we didn't get that. Somehow, Frieza survived. Now we know that his kind is extra durable, but it was a huge surprise back then. 
Not only that, but he has a father, who's around his power level too. Some sources say that Cold's stronger, others say he's weaker. But both agree though, that in terms of power, both of them were pretty close. Who is after revenge? That's a lot to unpack there. Oh boy. Well, I mean, okay, it's a little brash, but it's still salvageable. This would naturally call for a huge climactic battle on Earth, round two, where every Z fighter is going to have to give it their all against the evil emperors. The defense of Earth. So it won't share the fate of the old Nemec and Vegeta, right? Wait, wait, who's that guy? What's he doing? Why does he have a sword? Why can he turn Super Saiyan? Why did he slice through Freezer and King Cold with such ease? Yeah, as if they were made of space butter. What? He's whose son? Yeah, there's no mistaking what we felt back in the day. When we were teenagers, Future Trunks was cool. Heck, he still kind of is. But honestly, looking at this whole situation now, with our realistic shades on, things aren't looking so cool anymore. Not only is Goku's victory over Freezer just about 15 episodes ago kind of flipped around on its own head, more things come into sharp focus. By revealing that Freezer had survived Goku's power, the destruction of Nemec, and has now been rebuilt from the ground up, just like that? The main villain of the previous arc and his father were not even given a fitting platform in which to stage a somewhat credible second attack. Instead, their place in the story got changed into being a simple power measure for a new character. A character, mind you, whose origins would sound like it came from a fanfic if you released it today. Let's be real for a second here. If Future Trunks was about now, he'd sound a bit fanfic-y. He's got history behind him. Going back to Trunks specifically for a second, Vegeta and Bulma had very little in terms of interaction, and at this time, them hooking up felt really unlikely. Not only that, but the whole Future and Super Saiyan thing feels convoluted. What's even funnier is that until poor Trunks returned to his future, he hadn't achieved anything memorable in terms of fighting. Luckily, Kakarot's new DLC adds tons to his story, and gives him a lot in terms of his heroic victory over Deborah. That was just briefly mentioned in the super anime. A mere afterthought, and something that we were supposed to assume as common knowledge. Wait, 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 wait though. Trunks took down, with no trouble, the King of the Demons. That's pretty big. Thanks to the DLC though, Trunks has become a proper fighter, and ensures a bright and peaceful future for his timeline. Right? Right? Oh, crap baskets. Now, wait, wait, I do understand that this is touching some nerves. We never said anything about these cop-outs being a bad thing. These moments were pretty cool, and we do see why they were included in the first place. Toriyama wanted to have moments which he, like us, would find really cool, and something that if he were to be a reader, would keep him engaged with the story. With this fantastical mood, Toriyama could truly make plot twists which would wow audiences even if they weren't the most solidly constructed. We gotta remember that though. They may not make the most sense, but they're entertaining. Another infamous example of a change that kinda had massive consequences and came out of nowhere is Cell's nucleus. Not only did Cell return from the brink of death at the hands of Goku, in his perfect form no less, after being reverted to semi-perfect from spitting out 18, it meant that also Goku's sacrifice hadn't done that much, and our heroes had lost their strongest fighter outside of Gohan for nothing. But then, on top of all of that, we somehow ignore the fact that not long ago, we had Cell losing his head. An entire upper torso. Is this blasted nucleus thing moving around his body or something? Also, it managed to survive his own explosion. Somehow. Not only is this pretty confusing, but the English dub makes a better case for it. Making sense for once back in the day, the original one where it states that if at least one single cell survives, cell can regenerate from it. But it kind of gives cell an extra layer of plot armor at the same time, also stretching the battle out for a few more episodes. Yeah, Gohan vs. Cell is very iconic, something that cannot be overstated enough. But you cannot help but wonder sometimes if this couldn't have been done in a more orderly manner, something of which would make more sense, including Vegeta going Super Saiyan 2 at the sight of his dead future son. Huh, but these problems are actually pretty minuscule when it comes to the likes of the hypersonic lion tamer. I mean, the hyperbolic time chamber. I mean, the room of spirit and time, also known as the room of infinite BS. Apparently, Goku spent one month in there in the original Dragon Ball. But still, it makes you think. If Goku knew about this place the whole time, since the years he spent with Kami before the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament, 
It really, really, really could have come in handy before the Cell Saga. Heck, even that year before Vegeta and Nappa's arrival would have done. Surely Kami could have stuck the likes of Ten Shin Han and Krillin in there for a spell, even if it was just for a couple of weeks or months. Honestly, the gains they could have had of even just a few weeks worth of training would have been tremendous. And some of those characters could have gotten their missing years back with Dragon Balls if they really needed to. Granted, this all stems back from Toriyama's improvised plot progression. He wouldn't have known about the Room of Spirit and Time back in the day when he was writing the original Dragon Ball, but surely it would have been a nice thing to have added a line stating why Goku hadn't mentioned it before. For example, Goku could have said, Oh, I would have suggested it before, but it was really bad in there. I wouldn't want any of you to go through it. Easy. Sorted. Also, any kind of peril now related to the effect of staying too long in the chamber has sort of been negated, especially by Vegeta, who should really have a loyalty card these days after all the time he's spent in there. And oh yeah, Dende's removed the two-year rule so you can now use that room as much as you like. Or at least, as long as your body can hold out before old age comes into play. Luckily, it can't do much for Vegeta these days, diminishing returns and whatnot. But still, the chamber has become synonymous with a little cheap deus ex machina. Not only that, but knowing that it exists makes our what-if lives harder, as we need to maneuver around it and use, or not use it, accordingly. But still, by far, the biggest game changer that came up out of nowhere was Saiyan Power, or the Zenkai Boost. Technically, we saw it first with the Ultra Divine Water in the original Dragon Ball. Well, we kinda saw it, as the boost was retconned to be the Saiyan thing, and not exclusive to the magical liquid. It has now become a staple of the series. A staple, mind you, that kept all non-Saiyan main characters way behind. Which, as you know, watching this channel, it's not exactly our favourite thing. The little thing is the very tool of the Saiyan that makes it hard for any non-Saiyan to keep up outside of a foreign power imbuing itself on a particular party. Namekian fusion, for instance. Honestly, transformations might be powerful, but the Saiyan power, or Zenkai as the fandom calls it, might be perhaps the most overpowered thing about the Saiyans. So long as you can survive a big injury, you get stronger anyway. Sure, there is a limit, but still, this limit has led both Goku and Vegeta to a level of ungodly ridiculousness. It is iconic, sure, but it kinda gave Goku a huge advantage over his friends, an advantage that today only Vegeta may dream to match. Okay, the purpose of this list isn't to tell you that, oh, Dragon Ball was always pulling things out of its backside to enforce certain plot points, and that's good. We don't want to fully defend those decisions, as ultimately, they lead to cool scenes, but they might leave a really bitter aftertaste. We just want to show you that certain narrative shortcuts aren't native to the modern iteration of the story and Toyotaro's writing. You don't just blame him. It's rather actually the DNA of Toriyama's storytelling as well. In a way, these two are acting like the two Zenos. If it looks cool, it's loud, whether we like it or not. That's how Dragon Ball is and has been and will most likely continue to be. Hopefully, Granola's thing will get a decent explanation though, in the fullness of time or the saga will give us so many things to think about, we may forget about this thing that happened in chapter 73. You can always hope. But what do you folks think? Are these things that we mentioned actual cop-outs? Or do you think there is a good explanation nestled in there somewhere? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I shall see you in the next video. Catch you later.